Welcome back to the Lair Cryptic Crew. The Hanging Judge, a murderer trying to flee the scene of his crime, and chocolate store owners? <laughs> it's an odd mix, to be sure. But in Bastion Square, there are only three of the many spirits you're likely to run into, if you dare to explore the area. In a city that prides itself on paranormal happenings, the square reigns supreme with things that go bump in the night. Every building is said to have at least one ghost, and even the alleys have supernatural reputations. Murders, criminals business store owners, and victims find themselves spending eternity in Bastion Square. Why is it so haunted? Some say it's ley lines, energy forces that supposedly connect major historic structures and important landmarks. Others say the area is built on sacred indigenous land. And then, of course, there's the created history of being a center for hangings, murders, tragic deaths, plus speculation that at least one architect may have been dabbling in the occult. Grab your salt, your iron, and whatever protective magic you've got, Cryptic Crew. In today's episode, we're digging into the creepy history of Bastion Square in Victoria, British Columbia and those who still roam the buildings and alleys. Welcome to another episode of Cryptically Yours, Creepy Tales. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter at crypticallyyours.com to become an official member of the Cryptic Crew. Not only will you keep up to date on the latest news and happenings, but we'll be sending out a special invite to a Halloween Discord live chat. You can also look for us on your favorite social media platform. Be sure to check out the website for links and details. If you're looking for the most haunted building in Bastion Square, you're in luck because it's also the one directly in the middle of the area. Known as the Maritime Museum until 2014, and before that, the courthouse, the site began as police barracks and jail. Prisoners sentenced to be executed by hanging died in the yard, and unclaimed bodies were buried there in a pit of lime. When it was time for the new courthouse to be built, they dug up the yard and mixed it into the foundation of the new building, without considering the unmarked graves. If they were trying to make a haunted courthouse, I can't think of a better way than mixing the bones of hanged men into the foundation. I mean, seriously, if I were going to write a novel or even just a list of how best to ensure you have a haunted building, mixing the bones of hanged men into the foundation would definitely be at the top probably followed by building your house over a cemetery where they only moved the headstones and left the bodies. But anyway, moving on. So, be it that the folks who built the new courthouse didn't know about the unmarked graves, or didn't care, the results were exactly the same. Major supernatural activity. The most frequently seen ghost is that of the hanging judge, Matthew Bigby. He got the nickname from sentencing 24 men to hang, the majority of whom were indigenous, including several chiefs from the Chicotan Nation. He roams through the building, although his favorite places to haunt seemed to be his former courtroom, running up and down the stairs, and stalking through the halls. Some say the tall, slender man with goatee is responsible for keeping the other spirits lurking around in line, preventing them from causing any more mayhem than they already do. Others say he's on the prowl, looking for another guilty man to punish. Either way, the scent of pipe smoke and the sound of footsteps should be taken as a warning that the hanging judge is approaching, and it would be best to get the heck out of his way 
since he's known to simply move through anyone in his path, leaving the person with a bone-deep sense of chill and terribly shaken. He is also known to photobomb in the background of photographs, as well as show up when a guest behaves in a manner he deems to be inappropriate. So it's best to mind your manners if you happen to be in that building. Otherwise, you could find yourself facing the judge. Not as frequently spotted as the hanging judge is another ghost known only as the woman in white. Nobody seems to know who she was or what it is she wants, but everyone who's had the unfortunate luck to encounter her describes being overcome with sadness and grief, some sobbing for days after having met her without any cause other than having crossed her path. But the building itself has had some issues which, given its foundation, probably comes as a shock to none of you. In one room of the museum, people complained of feeling choked or having a weight on their shoulders. A bit of research showed that it was where the gallows once were. In a room closed to the public, staff had feelings of overwhelming despair and grief. Turns out that's where prisoners waited to hear their verdicts. Is it ghosts lingering, or do such strong emotions leave a sort of psychic residue, painting the walls with despair? No doubt part of the issue is that the building was the site of a museum for many years. How much of the activity was from the building itself, and how much was from the artifacts on display? I suspect that the building worked as a sort of supernatural battery, amplifying whatever it is that came in. This seems to be confirmed with the Empress of Ireland exhibit. The Empress is known to be the worst maritime disaster in Canadian waters, often compared to the more famous Titanic. It collided with a Norwegian freighter on the St. Lawrence and sank in 14 minutes. Out of 1,477 people, only 465 survived. The exhibit resulted in a marked increase in paranormal poltergeist activity. Pictures flying off walls, artifacts moved around, and visitors claiming to see apparitions. Overall, poltergeist activity seems to run through the building. On the second floor below the courthouse where ship models and exhibits of the Canadian Coast Guard and lighthouses were, as well as the souvenir shop, Tales of things floating through the air, voices, things moved around and apparitions popping in and out of existence abound. It'll be interesting to discover if further hauntings are reported in the new location, or if it really was a combination of the building and exhibits that caused such a high incidence of spooky moments for visitors. Enjoying the show? I'd love to hear from you. Drop a comment below or visit us at crypticleors.com. You can sign up for the newsletter, become an official member of the Cryptic Crew, and receive a special invite to a live Halloween chat. If you have a suggestion for a future episode, drop it in a comment either here or on our website. Who knows? Your idea could be our next creepy tale. Reviews would also be welcome on Podchaser, as well as your favorite podcast platform. And speaking of spooky, Fantan Alley is creepy by design, at least if you're the slightest bit inclined to claustrophobia. It's the narrowest street in Canada and part of one of the oldest Chinatowns in the country, and is haunted by a murderer. Back in 1889, a 17-year-old by the name of Ah Chung fell in love with Yao Kum, a sing-song girl. She'd been bought by Yip Tang, and yes, I do mean bought. Sex trafficking has a long history, and Canada is no exception. Her job was to sit in the window, flirting and calling out to men to lure them into the brothel. 
She was also known as the most beautiful woman in Chinatown. Chung, being a naive sort, thought her friendliness must mean she was actually in love with him, rather than simply doing her job. He proposed to her one evening. She very gently rejected him, explaining her owner would never let her go. Chances are this wasn't the first time she dealt with someone thinking there was something more to her interactions than simply doing her job, and Yao probably thought that was the end of it. Until Chung returned with the vial of poison. He explained she was to add it to Yip's food, and then, once he was dead, the two of them could run off together and live happily ever after. Well, Yao freaked, not to put too fine a point on it. Not only was she never going to murder her owner, she told the teenager that she didn't love him, would never love him, and even if she could marry, it wouldn't be to him. She sent him away and told him never to come near her window again. Humiliated and now obsessed with revenge, Chung plotted his payback. He convinced a friend that if they kidnapped Yao and got her away from the brothel, Chung could convince her of his love and they could run away together. His friend, apparently being either the romantic sort who saw nothing wrong with kidnapping a young woman in the name of true love, or not being the brightest crown in the box, agreed. He distracted Yao while Chung snuck up to her window. Grabbing her hair as she leaned out the window, Chung decapitated her. While his friend no doubt was rooted to the spot in horror, Chung took off through the alley, pushing people out of the way, and disappeared into the American hotel where he worked. He was later discovered in the coal bin, still wearing clothes soaked in Yao's blood. Unwilling to face a trial, he died by suicide in the cell, using his own shirt to hang himself. Yao was buried with great ceremony as tradition dictated, and her spirit has never been found to haunt the area. Chung, however, was dumped in a pauper's grave and made his presence known almost immediately. At the hotel, an invisible presence would pull workers' hair, step on their heels, and generally torment them until all the Chinese workers refused to enter the hotel. Once traditional rituals were performed, including food being left out for him, things eased up considerably. Still, if the food offering was forgotten, knives would spin off counters, food got dumped on the floor, and stoves were either cranked up high or turned off completely. Fridges were left open, and workers complained of someone lurking right behind them. Even now, over a hundred years later, if food and drink isn't left out, activity increases dramatically. Chung isn't content to lurk around the hotel, either. People traveling through Fantan Alley have seen a young man, covered in blood, racing toward them. Reports of being shoved, a strong wind whipping down the alley on a still night, and the sound of stampeding footsteps are common. Now, let's look at Roger's chocolates for a bit of a sweeter story, if you'll pardon the pun. Charles and Leah Rogers built their candy store in Bastion Square in 1903. They're famous for inventing the Victoria Cream, naturally flavored whipped cream centers smothered in dark chocolate. While distracted by their business, their only child, Freddie, ran a bit wild. <laughs> a bit wild? The kid was a freaking menace! His favorite thing to do was buy dynamite at the hardware store, chop it into pieces, then get on a streetcar. Sitting there, he'd light it, then toss it out the window so it exploded in midair. He'd escape in the resulting chaos, laughing his butt off. It was such an issue that a law was passed banning him from public transportation. Undeterred, he continued to experiment with the exploding things, 
until his luck ran out. He mangled his right hand, turning it into something described as a crab claw, lost hearing in his right ear and vision in his right eye. A year later, at the age of 15, he died by suicide. His devastated parents threw themselves into their business, living at the store. They rocked in wicker chairs by the candy stoves at night until grabbing a few hours sleep in the offices upstairs. When Charles died in 1927, Leah sold the business. She died in 1958. The hauntings began immediately upon Charles' death and increased dramatically after Leah's. Charles goes moves candy-making tools around, ties workers' shoelaces together if they stand still for too long, throws coins around upstairs, stomps loudly through the office, opens and closes doors and drawers, flicks lights on and off, and the office radio is known to turn on by itself. Leah's ghost is a bit more helpful. She straightens the chocolates and redoes window displays when the staff don't arrange them to her liking. Once, a customer tried a sample and didn't like it. Which, I mean, fair, not everyone's going to like everything, right? But instead of tossing it into the garbage, the woman put it back on the tray. Ew. As she was leaving, something hit her in the back of the head. Turning around, she realized it was the tried sample. Someone had thrown it at her. She was about to protest when she realized none of the people in the shop had moved. Nobody could have thrown it at her. At least, nobody she could see. Leah didn't tolerate nonsense or rudeness in her store, and putting a bitten sample back on the tray certainly qualified as both. One period of increased activity happened when the store decided to introduce a line of milk chocolates. Opening the store each evening, they discovered piles of the chocolate on the floor squished into muck. Whole trays were dumped out, stove burners were turned off during the making of the milk chocolate. Speculation was that since Charles had only made dark chocolate, he was having himself a bit of a tantrum. A manager went into the empty store, no doubt feeling pretty awkward, and explained why they were expanding into milk chocolate and that the sabotage was hurting the business. The tampering stopped immediately. Christmas season was one of the busiest for Rogers Chocolates, and December of 1980 was no exception. A strange handprint began appearing on a security mirror eight feet off the ground. It promptly reappeared every time it was cleaned off. Frustrated, a manager ordered each worker to measure their hand against it, determined to catch, and no doubt fire, whoever was messing around. They soon realized that it was the print of a mangled hand. Crab claw-like, even. It seemed that Freddy had decided to visit his parents for the holidays and wanted to be sure people knew he was around. Now, those are only a handful of stories about Bastion Square. Each year, thousands of tourists, paranormal investigators, and those looking for a bit of a scare hang out in the square hoping to experience a brush with the other side. Some choose to stay at the Empress Hotel, which I covered in another episode. Ghost tours are a thriving business in Victoria, especially around Halloween. Whatever the reason that makes Bastion Square such an attraction to the dead, it definitely works on the living, too. I'm afraid that's all there is for this episode, Cryptic Crew. So, do you think tonight's creepy tale was fact, fiction, or somewhere in between? You can drop a comment below, head over to crypticallyyours.com, or hunt us down on your favorite social media platform. Return to the lair next week and discover what else we've dug up for you. 
This is Grace Stone, your host, reminding you to always keep it creepy, cryptids.